welcome to Motown USA, Detroit City, for the first of two special Motor Week programmes that will bring you exclusive detailed coverage of this very important international motor show. Out here on the cold, mean streets of Detroit, overshadowed by huge buildings and the massive Renaissance Centre, now the headquarters of General Motors, it's hard to think of Detroit back in the 18th century as a small township ruled by the French. In fact, the French war chief at the time eventually had a classic American car named after him. His name? Monsieur Pontiac. Now, which great leaders have we Brits named a vehicle after? I can only think of Churchill, and that was a tank. Here in Detroit, we've been taken by storm on the Jaguar stand with the unveiling of the brand new F-Type concept car. Jonathan Browning from Jaguar Cars, um, everybody loves this. Yeah, it's been a super reaction. I mean, the, the F-Type is really the spiritual successor to the E-Type. And you remember the, the responses E-Type used to get. Well, this, this has been terrific today, really super reaction. Just tell, tell us something about the development work and, and where this car really came from. Well, uh, our previous design director, Jeff Lawson, who sadly passed away in the middle part of this year, had started work on, on this concept and he, his original drawings were taken on by the design team and then our new design director, Ian Callum, really came in in the last couple of months, worked on the interior. But you know, this, is, this is really a Jeff Lawson uh, sketch that has now come to light in a, in a concept car. There's a lot of work to be done. We haven't done any of the engineering feasibility studies yet. So really, it's a it's a pure design concept for a compact Jaguar sports car. And so we we let the team have free reign in terms of what would make uh, the ideal successor to the E-Type, and they've come up with this. People are passionate about Jaguar. When you're trying to design a Jaguar, that can be absolutely daunting because the expectation of the public high particularly when you're getting into Jaguar sports cars. I suppose what I was aiming at is to try and create a simple, elegant, hopefully very desirable sports car that people would just want to own and drive. When I decided it was time to load up the truck and move the family to Colorado, USA, it meant saying goodbye to my Chrysler Voyager V6, which very comfortably sat eight people. Stateside, what to buy? Well, as you know, in America, bigger is always better, so I went for the biggest family truck I could find, and this is it, the Ford Expedition with its V8 Triton engine, which gets me a massive 14 miles to the gallon. Not that that's a problem, of course, because petrol here is currently about 80 pence a gallon, and you're paying something like four pounds a gallon. It's enormous. You can well imagine that it can comfortably seat up to eight people. You'll get the family and the kids in there and no problem. But rather like the Voyager, it has a problem in the boot department. There's not a lot of space back there, as you can see. So the Ford designers got together and thought, how do we resolve that problem? Should we reconfigure the inside? No, 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 they said. Let's just make the expedition even bigger. And here it is. This is the Ford Excursion. It is quite honestly the most colossal family car you're ever going to see. It's seven feet high. It's 19 feet long. And now, as you can well imagine, there's no problem about getting all your goods and chattels in there as well. This is the fourth and latest concept from Bugatti since they came under VW's ownership a couple of years ago. It seems that almost every motor show produces a new Bugatti concept car, and this one was originally launched at Tokyo in the autumn. It's called the Veyron, and it's our first chance to see it here in Detroit. It was produced by VW's in-house design team, led by the Czech Joseph Cabin, and features all the usual Bugatti things you would expect, that famous badge and grill, and of course, swooping lines. The car is hotly tipped to go into production soon. Under the bonnet is this whopping engine, an 18-cylinder, 6.3-litre engine, producing 555 brake horsepower. It also features these chrome air intake covers, which help improve airflow into the engine. Now, it's tipped to go up against the likes of the top Ferraris, the 550 Maranello, the 360 Medina, to name just a few, and is expected to go into production in the year 2003. 
Now, there's been great debate back in the UK from the government who wants us to get out of our cars and use public transport more. Something like this Detroit People Mover. But unfortunately, it just goes round and round in a circle. This is a great example to Mr Prescott on how not to do public transport. The monorail sounds exciting, but it does go round in a loop from the Renaissance Centre right the way down, round downtown back to the Renaissance Centre through some rather shady areas that have definitely seen better days. And in fact, the People Mover was actually closed for a whole year and only reopened a couple of months ago and nobody seemed to bat an eyelid or remember that it actually still worked. It's a great idea, but it's totally impractical. Come on, let's go back and play with some more cars. <laughs> This is the O21C and it's the face of Fords to come, according to the company. It's based on the Fiesta platform and despite its old-fashioned looking exterior, it's bristling with high technology. For a start, look at the rear hinge doors here, which make the interior space look colossal, although I'm not sure about the safety of this without any B-pillars here. In fact, the car is something like 19mm shorter than the Ford car, but it has lots of great little details as well. Look at the, the trunk, as they call it here in the in America, the way this slides out to give you lots of easy access and room back here. And meanwhile, back in the seats, which will swivel 90 degrees to g easily gain access in and out, there are these wonderful dials, which you can change direction with at the touch of a joystick, so that the dials are always facing exactly the right angle to where the driver or the passenger wants them to be. And if you're still not happy with the position of the dials, well, why not change the position of the whole dashboard as well? Very clever. My favourite and certainly the most unusual feature has to be this single white light emitting diode, which is the headlamp. And the technology in here makes it twice as bright as any other previous light emitting diodes. Well, the whole of Ford's philosophy here is retro future styling. It's aimed at young people with the idea of getting them hooked in young and keeping them on Ford products for life. Although Chrysler were taken over by Daimler Mercedes-Benz some 18 months ago, thankfully the designers at Chrysler have not been stifled and they're still coming up with some stunning designs in the shape of new concept cars as we've seen at the show this week. Four concepts were unveiled to the press yesterday here at the Detroit 2000 show, ranging from a 4x4 through a pickup truck, a new convertible and a street legal road racer. The Jeep Varsity is the new small baby 4x4 in the Jeep range. Concept at the moment, but should go into production maybe in a couple of years' time, designed to compete with something like, say, a Land Rover Freelander. Jeep Varsity uh, uh, Urban Adventure says that we really think we could, we could expand the Jeep uh, heritage a little bit, the Jeep uh, lineup a little bit, uh, to maybe come off the pure sport utility and a little bit into more of a passenger vehicle sport utility. Uh, they call them hybrids, and, and we, we really think that there's a, an opportunity. Uh, a lot of our customers who drive Jeeps, surprisingly, have given us a lot of strong imp input on a more of a Jeep car. Now, traditionally, pickup trucks are designed with cargo and hauling in mind. It was all about utilities in the 30s and 40s when pickup trucks were first introduced. But now, things are beginning to change. Pickup trucks need to be comfortable and luxurious and specifically to carry the family as well. So you need four doors, you need some comfort, you need some luxury, and the Dodge Max Cab seems to fit the bill. Max Cab is, is as you know, spending a few days here in, in the US, uh, the, the truck portion of the business, particularly passenger truck, whether it's sport utilities or, or the metamorphosis of the pickup trucks is just really exploding into passenger type vehicles and, and the theme on the on the max truck is passenger priority here's a possibility to do a very even family oriented with a rear child seat built in family or oriented truck and still more concepts to come from chrysler i think of the four this is my personal favorite it's called the chrysler 300 hemi c and as you can see it's a luxury convertible car with room for four an all-american v8 luxury performance convertible is how they describe it 353 brake horsepower 5.7 liters i just think it looks great 
the big thing about the, the 300 Hemi C is the rear wheel drive aspect of it. Uh, obviously, big powerful engine rear wheel drive, and, and we make no claim that we'll build that, that vehicle, but it says that uh, we're probably looking pretty hard at rear wheel drive. Certainly, there's a lot in our uh, product community that would love to do a, a, a rear wheel drive car. The Dodge Viper is one of those cars that's a rare sight on the streets of the UK, but still has the ability to turn heads thanks to its blistering performance. Now, it's getting a little bit long in the tooth, so it's time for something a bit fresh in the Dodge Viper vein. And that's why they've come up with this concept, the Dodge Viper GTS-R, based on the Le Mans Endurance car. 500 brake horsepower, 8 litre all aluminium V8 engine, top speed of well over 200 miles an hour, 0 to 60 in less than 4 seconds. A concept at the moment, but expect to see this in production in the next couple of years. It's about aspiration. It says our brand, uh, we, we've really leveraged the brand. We don't sell many Vipers in Europe yet. Uh, we think that the, for the Chrysler brand, it, it sort of epitomizes the creativity and the aggressiveness uh, of our product community to say, and, and that was one of the most daring concepts we did several years ago. Uh, and to much to everybody's delight and amazement, uh, about 24 months after we sh showed that vehicle, the original Viper right here at this motor show, uh, guess what? It came to production. So it says that, that we're going to continue that spirit of, of innovation and creativity and maybe even a little bit of outrageousness. Just when everybody might be expecting us to go one way, we like to go the other end. And uh, this probably does it as well as anything we could, we could do. Uh, when everybody else will be talking about one thing, we'd like to be showing the muscle that we have to really do things that have the opportunity, that have the promise of coming through to production and no other company has delivered on it as well as we have. With the Detroit launch of their newly restyled V70, Volvo have gone all altruistic and charitable. Not content to just look after the green, clean emissions of their own car, this radiator grill is designed to clean up the mess of other car manufacturers. The radiator contains a catalytic coating which can clean up up to 75% of ozone caused by smog. And it's not only the people outside of the car that'll thank Volvo. Inside, there are differences too. Volvo also used Detroit to introduce their new Volvo V70 Cross Country. And I took the opportunity to catch up with design director Peter Horbury, who explained the ideas behind it. Uh, the, the first thing we changed was the whole front end. I mean, most of the sheet metal is common with the new V70. But the front end uh, is all plastic, and we were able to change that quite easily and quite, uh, quite substantially. Uh, it's in a dark material, it's uh, practical, but also in a visual way it enhances the height difference of the car. The car is actually some 55, 60 millimeters higher off the road than the standard V70, but to give it visual extra height, let's say, we've made this contrast line between the, the dark nose and the sheet metal as high as we could so the eye is lifted if you follow the car around you see the wheel arches they have uh, moldings over them which takes that line up again and right through the doors there's a split line between the plastic and the metal which all the time is helping to lift this this uh, extra height visually higher still but its sister car the new Volvo V70 was being billed as a significant new car from Volvo so I caught up with Hans Gustafsson the senior vice president for product and process engineering to find out why we have taken this car an even further step out into when it comes to comfort and versatility I think that's the it's, it's, it's the the most for me, the most uh, significant, change, significant change. Then, of course, if you take the whole design, this is a much more modern product than the products we have in, 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 the, in, the, in the range test of today. But the things that you feel when you drive, flexibility and, and, and comfort. You're watching a MotorWeek special direct from Detroit. Yes, the Detroit 2000 show is certainly a huge and important one from the Motor City in the USA. And we'll show you some more concept cars and production cars after the break. Join us then. Hello there and welcome back to more exclusive coverage of the International Motor Show here in Motown itself, Detroit City, USA. 
Now, back in the UK, people continue to moan about the rip-off prices we're forced to pay for cars. And you know, when it comes to entrance tickets for motor shows, we could be being ripped off as well. To get into a major UK show, you can pay up to £20 a ticket. Here in Detroit, the automobile capital of the world, it's just $10, £6. Of course, if you continue to watch Motor Week, your ticket to the Detroit Motor Show is absolutely free. So let's go back inside. Now, you may think that some of the cars that we're showing you here from Detroit this year are just great big yank tanks. Well, they might well be. One person who can tell us exactly the state of the market is Autocars US correspondent Howard Walker. The whole market now is global. I mean, you think of General Motors, Vauxhall in the UK, the whole source is here. You think of Ford in the UK and Europe, everything comes from Dearborn now. And this whole show is, is really a kind of a, an eye-opener of what the rest of the world is going to see over the next three or four years. I mean, it's a, it goes on forever. You see the size of it and the variety of the products. Um, with Jaguar launching new cars here rather than in, in the UK, um, Ford launching cars here. I mean, it is now the barometer of the whole uh, world market. So it has a vast, a vast importance not just for the UK but for everywhere in the world. The crazy thing is that Mercedes has just overtaken Cadillac and Lincoln to be the, uh, the luxury best-selling uh, brand over here, which is, is unbelievable to think that Mercedes has overtaken the, the great domestics. And it's, it's ca cash-rich markets, it's a luxury market, uh, everybody wants to sell here, and it, it's really an untapped market. This year they sold 16 million, last year they sold 16 million cars, which is a record. So the, the volume is, is, is phenomenal. So everybody wants a slice of that big pie. In America, they want a car the size of a transit van. I mean, and as many seats as they can. You know, petrol is cheaper than uh, bottled water over here, and it still is, and there's no sign that it's going to get any more expensive. So the, America, was, it's only a 200-year-old country, so everything has been evolved around the car. You go into a, a, a parking uh, garage, and the spaces are twice as wide as they are in Europe or the rest of the world. So people use cars as lifestyle. There's no public transport over here to talk about. So everybody has to have a car to move around with. So they want bigger and they want better and cars are so cheap over here. So there's no reason why you shouldn't have bigger cars. OK, I'm going to give you three seconds to guess what was the top selling car in the United States last year. One, two, three. Well, I can't hear you, but I can tell you it was the Toyota Camry. In fact, it was the best selling car the year before that as well. Now, this year it's going to be introduced to the UK later on with a new sleeker rounded design. It's now safer than it ever was. It's got four stars in the independent NCAP crash tests. And they'll also be introducing a new 2.2 litre 16 valve engine. Now, although they clearly love their Toyotas here in the United States, they simply don't seem to have the same cachet in Europe and the UK. And if it were me and I still lived in the UK, well, I'd probably be saving up to buy the 5 Series BMW. Well, here on the Toyota stand, things are a little bit quieter now, but earlier on this morning, this was launched. It's the new Toyota Prius, and it's the world's first mass-produced petrol electric motor hybrid vehicle. And it really is a revolutionary car. Now, this has been on sale in Japan for some two years. It's coming to the States this year. It's also coming to Europe and the UK, hopefully later this year too. And it really is quite revolutionary. It's a car that will do up to 60 miles a gallon. It's a combination, as I say, of petrol and electric motor. There is your conventional 1.5 litre petrol engine producing some 55 brake horsepower. In the back are the batteries and the electric motor, which in turn produce 40 horsepower. So a combination of the two engines allows you to, well, nip along quite nicely. What the car actually does, under heavy acceleration, the petrol engine is used more, and at idle speed and in stop-go traffic, that's when the electric motor comes into its own. The Prius was designed by Toyota's styling team in Southern California. California, of course, is so very strict with emissions control. Whether it's quite the case for something in the UK remains to be seen, but it really is a very clever and the world's first mass-produced hybrid car. One of the problems that American car manufacturers have in selling their models, particularly in the UK and Japan, is that, well, everything's simply on the wrong side. And it's expensive for car manufacturers to move the steering wheel and the pedals over there because there have to be mechanical links to the engine. 
However, as you may know, if you've ever taken a ride in an aircraft these days, you may well have been flown by wire. Fly-by-wire technology exists, which means that the steering wheel, the pedals can be linked to the engine electronically. No need for mechanical links. Well, at the moment, we're not allowed to do that. We're not trusted for safety reasons. But in the UK, the AA is behind a movement to change all that. So in the future, it could be really neat. You could drive from the UK to France, park, simply pick up the steering wheel, the pedals, put them on that side, and off you go. Mediterranean, here we come. For most of us, owning something like a Porsche is but a dream until we win the lottery. However, at motor shows you can always come onto the stand, look at the cars and think about what might be, and then come and take a look at all the accessories you can get. You can have a baseball cap, some sunglasses, a remote control car, a tie, a pen, a watch even. You can also have t-shirts and fleeces and tennis rackets. You can have Porsche bikes but it doesn't beat the real thing. And the latest model to be introduced by Porsche is the Porsche 911 Turbo, which is over here. Porsche have always had a long tradition of putting turbochargers into their car, and the latest 911 is no exception. Some two years after its original launch, this is the new 911 Turbo. 420 brake horsepower, under the rear, of course, at the back four-wheel drive, 0-60 to 60 in just over four seconds, a top speed of 190 miles an hour. It is an awesome car, but also packed with awesome technology to make sure you keep on the straight and narrow. The prices of these cars will be touching £100,000 when they go on sale in the UK shortly. If you want one, I suspect they've probably all been sold out. Well, if you're into motor racing, you'll be interested to know that Chevrolet Corvette are adding another chapter to their illustrious history by entering the Corvette C5R into the 68th running of the 24-hour Le Mans race. And at the helm will be British driver Justin Bell. Now, unfortunately, that car is not on display here, but this monster is. It's the Cadillac North Star 24-hour Le Mans prototype, and it, too, will be driven by Brit Andy Wallace. Well, that's the end of the first Motor Week programme from the Detroit International Auto Show for 2000. Join us again next week, though, here on Granada Men & Motors, when we'll have more exclusive coverage of the new cars, the cutting-edge concept cars, and how those cars might relate to the UK car market, and maybe we'll see some of them over there in the near future. Join us again next week. The stars from Detroit next week include the stunning Mercedes SLA Roadster, set to take on the MX-5, Elise and MGF. Plus, you can drool over the latest powerful Lamborghini and marvel at more weird concepts, including the curious Honda Sprocket and the awesome Buick LaCrosse. Only next week here on Motor Week.